Hey, my name's Lucas Morgan, and this is video number one of two covering my uh, my creation for the interactive and immersive HQ competition. This was a creative programming competition where we had one hour sessions to basically create a challenge and compete against uh, 31 other people. And uh, in the first challenge here, which was the interactive challenge, I created a game of Pong. So I want to kind of walk you through that and show you how I built it in the process. It's uh, quite simple because an hour is just not a lot of time and there's certain things I had to scrap certain things I would have done differently, you know, if I could go back and do it again. Uh, but there's certain things that worked out really well too. So it's kind of just a quick run through of that. Uh, so the first thing I did was I dropped in my Connect V2 and I brought in the color, and depth, X, Y, Z, and depth. These are just pre-calculated, uh, pre kind of ready to go passes. I did very minimal stuff here because this is already in uh, a three-dimensional space, which is wonderful. Uh, I used a chroma key to pull out the background, so I just had a mask representing myself, and I multiplied that over my depth so that I could kind of just take out all of these samples back here that I, I didn't really want to have uh, visible. I plugged my color into that as well, and then I actually put a PBR material on here, which you can see in here, and the PBR material uh, it was just an experiment, but it ended up looking kind of cool because I have these two lights, a red and a blue one, and they, uh, they just kind of shimmer and reflect in a nicer way because of the specular and uh, diffuse components of the PBR. So that was fun. Uh, that took very little time to set up, but that's not interactive or game. Uh, so what I ended up doing from there was I, I brought in a chop. Uh, and this is actually how I drive the positions of those lights. So if I have my hands close to my head, you know, I'll be um, kind of red and blue, kind of purple. Uh, my elbows are confusing the connect. Um, uh, so yeah, anyways, that X, Y, Z position uh, is being fed in from the connect shop to the left and the right light. Uh, and that's, that's about the only two things I use the Z coordinate for, right? Everything else had to happen on a two dimensional plane uh, because it's very difficult to play Pong with your hands. It's even more difficult to play in three dimensions, right? So I wanted this to be a two-dimensional graph of a space. So uh, what I ended up doing next was I created these two paddles and they are simply uh, flat-ish cylinders, right? And when I move my hand around, it moves in 3D space. Uh, I use the same coordinate space as the as the connect was providing, I just left the Z translate out. As you can see, I've got these set to zero. Uh, construction was very simple, just a couple circle stops and a poly loft. Um, uh, so that's pretty much the paddles. I merged those together, and as you see here, we've got uh, just two pieces of geometry floating around in 3D space. So uh, one thing I had to make sure uh, of was that the normals are facing out, right? You just want to make sure that this is uh, set up correctly. Um, and here's the actual uh, surface normals there. Uh, as you can see, they're not they're not crisscrossing. They're poking out in the right direction. Uh, and I'll talk about what, and there's a reason why I'm showing you this, <laughs> uh, but I'll come back to that in a bit. Uh, all right. So the particle system itself was just the particle chop, and uh, the way this was set up is I had a sphere scaled down very small, and rotating. Uh, it's rotating on. Uh, Z. And so what I discovered was even though there's a lot of points here, the first particle always comes from the same vertex, vertex zero. Uh, that's just how particle systems work. Uh, to randomize this, I would have to use a shuffle constantly. So my simple solution to randomizing the direction that the particle emitted in in a two-dimensional plane was to simply use that first vertex, which uh, was aligned correctly, and uh, just rotate the sphere, right? So every time it emitted, this rotation value would be somewhere different and thus the particle would go in a different direction from the center of the uh, of the world. So you can see here, I just keep restarting the game and it kind of goes in different directions. So uh, I used that to my advantage. It was very quick to set up. I scaled the normals down uh, considerably so that the Pong uh, particle moved slower and the particle system itself did not birth any new particles, right? Zero. Life expectancy was a thousand because I knew we'd never get that high. Uh, and every time we restart the game, we just hit this birth button, right? I'm basically just hitting this um, with my with my button and also with this logic here. But uh, the only other thing it does here is it resets the particle system first because uh, you don't want multiple pong balls, although that could be fun. Uh, I just wanted one. Uh, 
And so once this starts traveling, it's moving further and further away from the center of the world. You'll see that we have its position and uh, zero here. So we're actually calculating uh, the distance from the center. And once that distance gets above a certain threshold, which was 0 0.8, uh, basically it, it restarts the game. It triggers a script and it restarts the game. So that's pretty much it. All this is plugged into a render top through um, two geocops here, and that worked out pretty well. Uh, the paddles are just a constant color. I did want to get creative with the aesthetics of them, but it just wasn't time for that. Um, that's pretty much it. I will say one thing that I had a little bit of a challenge with was the collision detection. So you'll notice that if I hold my hand still, uh, things work relatively well. But if I start moving my hands around erratically, trying to hit this like I would in a video game, it just doesn't work well. Uh, it's very very bad at detecting collision of quick moving things, especially when those coll colliders are not in the same place every frame. Uh, I don't know quite how the particles SOP works in the in the back end. I don't know how these things, I'm sure there's ways to improve these. Uh, particle systems are just not a big part of my day-to-day -day, uh, programming work, so it's just not something I, I could speak in depth about. I will say that I think the newer edition of the bullet solver is probably a better particle system and probably does a better job of uh, detecting collisions. I think the main issue is that if uh, you have two objects in two different places in the next frame, they're in the opposite places, right? They're two, they never, they never cross paths and they never overlap. So uh, the collision is just not something that's detected very easily. Um, so that's pretty much it. Uh, it's a pretty simple game and Pretty simple game logic, but you know when you got an hour, you gotta work with what you got and um, do what you can. So, anyways, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. Hey, what's up, everyone? Uh, I'm Lucas Morgan, and this is a video kind of covering the second piece I did for the interactive and immersive HQ competition. Uh, this was a competition where 32 people had one hour to create uh, a challenge, and we've done two out of the four so far, and we'll do the rest uh, in the following weekend, but. Uh, in this particular challenge, this was the integration challenge, we had to basically create a, uh, an integration between Touch and another software. And on top of that, um, there was a, a piece of the, of the puzzle where, you know, essentially you, you brought in this module for the Twitch chat, uh, Twitch chat, and people would send messages formatted like this with the um, exclamation mark, then a color. And these would come in through this module that was provided for us. And we essentially took that information and we had to use it somehow to create something interesting on screen. Uh, so for me, given that I, I do a tremendous amount of programming around pixel mapping, lighting, previs, and control, I thought this would be a great opportunity to play to my strengths and do something uh, fun visual, uh, visually that was you know in my own vein of work. So I decided that I was going to use Blender for my integration software, and I decided that I wanted to... Uh, just basically move around a couple different lights in, uh, a, ver in a variety of like a visual setups, right? So basically a preset engine, a very simplified preset engine. Uh, this uh, seemed attainable because maybe a month uh, before or a few weeks before, I can't remember exactly, I found this plugin for Blender. It was called Node OSC Server. Uh, and this basically takes OSC messages coming out on localhost and it converts it into these message handlers, which then, uh, you know, using uh, this data path, I'm guessing it's using Python in the back end. Probably, it's taking it's taking that object, which is in my case a spotlight, and it's modifying its rotation or its location or whatever other parameters you want to control. You just create a message handler and you hook it up, and you have control. So, very neat plugin, and that was very important to kind of pulling this off. Uh, so over here in the network, uh, this is almost the network I had at the end of the competition. I've added this slider up here. Uh, so you can see kind of the presets uh, after the fact without actually seeing the messages come in. But the first thing I did, uh, my work started off with these three modules right here. Um, these modules are essentially a, um, essentially a cloned, well actually I didn't clone them, I didn't need to, uh, but they are a custom parameter driven uh, module that kind of 
is responsible for controlling the position of one light, uh, position and rotation. So over here under control, we have position, which is, uh, as you'd expect, just an X, Y, Z position for that light. Uh, rotation is the rotation value in radians, uh, and that's just how Blender um, expects the values. So I kind of had to work in radians for this project. Uh, so if I go ahead and just manually adjust this, you see that uh, I can move this left and right and up and down and rotation is the same way. So it's very simple. And again, we had an hour, right? So my, my main, my main goal was to create something that, you know, looked pretty good, had some interaction and it was complete at the end of the hour. So I didn't get too complex with this. I thought at first that I could control the angle of the beam and I spent probably more time than I should have trying to get that working, but it turns out there was, um, clearly a syntax issue in, in Blender. Uh, when you control the location, for example, the, the data path is, uh, you know, something dot data dot objects and then the name of the actual spotlight, but the angle is not a object level parameter. It's, it's buried somewhere else in the, um, the lamp, lamp parameters. And so anyways, I had some issues getting that to work. And so I ditched it. Uh, unfortunately, it would have been cool to have like narrow and wide beam angles, but nonetheless, um, still a lot we can do with position and rotation. So that's the custom parameters in control. In config, uh, I specify the OSC out. Uh, and then also the name, right, which is spot one. And that's also going to match what you see here in the outliner. Uh, and so basically, inside of each of these, we have uh, a lag for uh, position and rotation. So you can actually see, you know, the light snap from one preset to the other. I'm sorry, not snap, but essentially smoothly move. It's just more interesting visually. Uh, it wasn't necessary by any means. Um, so after the lag, it goes into a dat. And after the dat, it goes into a dat execute, which basically uh, grabs the OSC dat here in this uh, line five and line seven. It's sending OSC uh, using, you know, this name here, slash OS, uh, slash spot two. Uh, it's kind of combining that with location. And uh, this last section here, which looks a little bit more cryptic, uh, is basically a one-liner for taking a, a column of a table and converting it to a list of floats. So very, very compact. Uh, I'm used to doing list comprehension stuff like this a lot, so it's very fast for me to just set up. And so that's basically it. Each time these DATs change, they send OSC over the OSC DAT. So this is not sending any information. It doesn't need to, unless the information is changing. Um, maybe that optimization, optimization would be important on a bigger project, but for this, honestly, it probably didn't matter. Uh, but that's pretty much it. Once I had one of these working, I just copy pasted it and I made three. And that's pretty much it. Uh, I was able to control these manually with my, my own settings here. And so I knew the next thing to do was to connect the Twitch chat to the lights and somehow control some presets. So for that, I needed some presets. Uh, ironically, this is one of the two things in this particular challenge that took the most amount of time. Uh, and this is literally just a table, right? It's the simplest thing to do. It also takes time if you have lots of value to type in. And I wanted these presets to actually look interesting ish you know i didn't want them to just be random numbers um, i wanted there to be some symmetry and some cohesion to it so i actually went in here and i typed in values manually what's actually even more annoying than that was that you know i found out during the competition that blender um, <clears throat> so if i grab one of these cones go into the items i have this nice familiar degrees rotation of negative 57.3 but if you have your mouse over it, you'll see that radians equals negative one. And so actually what's happening is the UI for Blender is converting this to radians before it ever gets to the actual um, object parameter. And this probably makes sense from a programming standpoint, but from a control standpoint, now I got to think in radians. I discovered this in the middle of the, uh, of the thing. So I had to kind of tune my numbers uh, in terms of radians. And that's a little bit less intuitive. What I ended up doing, was I grabbed one of these lights and I said, all right, let's just see real quick 
um, what is the min and the max range? I saw I was okay, 57 to 57. Of course, we want the radian. So, okay, it's negative one to one on y. And so I remembered that number and I said, okay, I got to pick even consistent numbers that are between negative one and one, same with x, same with y. And basically, you know, having that information, it sped things up a little bit, right? Bunch of negative ones, uh, 4.5 here. Uh, and that probably, I had to figure that out in the spot. But anyways, even with that added constraint, uh, and same with positions, right? I kind of said, okay, what's my what's my range here? Um, negative two to two on x, negative two to or two to one on y, stuff like that. Uh, once I established those, I just kind of made up uh, numbers that looked okay uh, within those ranges, and I kept them uh, non-decimal numbers, right, just to make my life as easy as possible. Because at this point in the competition, there wasn't a whole lot of time left, so I just threw these numbers in. Uh, I did some tests on my own to make sure that they looked good and uh, they seemed they seemed solid enough. So after that, uh, I basically took the input that was coming out of the chat. I grabbed the latest. Uh, I kind of filtered it down to just the um, just the string, right? And basically that string is used to select one of these rows. And uh, right now for this video, I, I've got a slider hooked up so you can see we're basically just iterating through uh, strings and we're selecting a different row and that row is getting converted into a chop and that's getting plugged in to these custom parameters. So uh, yeah, so <laughs> ironically typing up this, uh, this preset table took probably about 10, 10 minutes or so, uh, well, maybe a little bit less, maybe eight minutes. Uh, the other thing that took some time that I did not expect uh, is same same reason, right? Is these message handlers in uh, Blender? You know, you make a new one. You can't copy, as far as I know, you can't copy paste one you've made. You've got to create a new one, and you got to fill in this, this, and this uh, manually. So you can copy paste, but you still got to change some of the numbers, right? And so this just took some time. There were some issues I ran into troubleshooting some some incorrect strings. Uh, but that took a little time too, probably about 10 to 12 minutes. So that's almost half of the hour, right? Just going to typing and stuff that I could have automated, uh, maybe if I had known or had some time to write a script, but writing a script takes time too, right? So, uh, the fastest solution was to just hammer it in, uh, manually. And I'm only dealing with three lights, right? Uh, three, doing four or five, I probably wouldn't have finished the challenge in time. So it was, it was. Uh, three was a good number. Let's just put it that way. Uh, something we didn't get to show off during the, the end was what happens when the user would send the Easter egg, right? Which is kind of this string of everything. Uh, and what that basically looks like or would have looked like is just <laughs> kind of chaos. Um, nothing fancy, right? Just just bunch of noise chops basically operating within a certain range. And uh, by the time we got around to ours, nobody was triggering this particular message, so we didn't get to see that. But uh, yeah, <laughs> that would have been entertaining for sure. Uh, all right, so that's basically it. Uh, so the integration took Twitch, and it took this module that they provided us and the messages coming out of it. It used it to drive basically a very simplified preset system in Touch, which then sent this information into Blender. And Blender has a nice real-time rendering engine called Eevee. As you can see, uh, the OSC messages coming in, even if they're static, it causes a refresh. And uh, because of the way Eevee works, if I stop that, oh, this might crash. No, it doesn't. It has like an iterative, iterative rendering technique that uh, basically just gets better the more time you let it go. And so you get your nice soft, soft shadows. Um, but it costs you a few frames, right, to get to that point. And so that's what that uh, flickering effect is. Uh, but you know, for this, for this entry, that was fine. I wasn't too worried about making this perfect. I just wanted it to look good. And for the most part, it did just fine. So that's pretty much it for this video. Thanks for watching. Uh, uh, that was, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's quite, <laughs> it's quite stressful to bust out something even that looks this simple in an hour is brain draining too. Holy cow. Uh, but man, it was a lot of fun and looking forward to seeing what people do in the next, uh, 
next competition, myself included. Thanks for watching.